So today, if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is where we're going to pick up, and we're going to start in verse 11. Hopefully you were able to get a set of notes when you were able to walk in. Those are going to kind of guide our time together, so certainly you want to be able to get those. If you're joining with us online, you can actually go to our website, nbcmetary.org. You can see that on your screen right now, and you'll be able to get those notes by clicking on services, and then we also have the answers just in case you might have missed something and so we'll be able to to go over those things now before we get into this I want to talk uh, something interesting happened to me this past week this Monday, we were off of school here at Memorial Baptist, and so uh, we had kind of taken the, the Monday off of school because of, of Easter, and so my wife and I decided to take our kids uh, to the North Shore and just spend some time. We went one of the state parks that's up there, and we just walked around, and we had lunch, and they had some playgrounds, and then we just had a fun time as a family. I got sunburned, you know, there's all those good things that happen, you know, when you get out in the wild, and so one of the things that we wanted to do before we left was we wanted to do one of the walking trails. And so there was a walking trail that was up there. And, and so we took the, the kids on it. But as many of y'all know, I have a three-year-old now. And so my three-year-old, you know, if you're going to do over a mile, maybe a mile a half, you know, she's got, she's got little legs. She's got little legs, you know, and cute little legs, you know, but she's got these little legs and so she's not able to keep up. So one of the best ways, not only to get her to come with us and, but also to corral her. If you're a, if you're a young father in here today, I'm just going to give you the secret. You just put them on your shoulders. Okay. You've got them there. They can't go anywhere and you're able to take them along with you. So I put her up on my shoulders and we're walking through. And of course we had mentioned something about things, you know, watch your step, you know, it's, it's warming up. There might be critters and stuff like that. So as we, so we're walking and we're walking. We're having a good time. Well, then we kind of we kind of crossed this bridge. It really wasn't like a very deep ditch at all. But, you know, there was still a bridge nonetheless that they wanted you to walk across. So we walked across it. No, no big deal. She's up on my so, my shoulders. I get about 15 feet past this bridge and, and she turns around and she's hollering and she says, Daddy, Daddy, there's a snake. There's a snake. And I'm looking and it wasn't in front of me. It wasn't beside me. It had been, it was beside. I walked right past it. I'm telling you, my foot went right by it. I mean, I could have stepped on it. And so we walked right past it. And here I am. I look around and I see that snake and I go, oh my goodness. Here I was telling everybody, watch for critters, watch your step, all that kind of thing. And here I was, and I didn't realize I was in their domain and I didn't even realize it and I needed to pay attention. This is what we're talking about. In this world, the Bible talks about how, how the devil, the enemy is a prince of this world. We look around. It's a fallen world. It's fallen by different things. We see natural disasters, earthquakes, fires, tsunamis. We see all, all different types of things, hurricanes that come, come our way. But then there's also other things that you are very well aware of, sin and violence and sexual sin, all of those things that are so gross to, to our world and that Satan has his domain. And I forget that walking around, we have to pay attention. We have to we have to walk carefully wherever we go. In your notes, I put a, a quote in there from C.S. Lewis that I want to call your attention to. We'll also put it up here on the screen. C.S. Lewis, in the, in the preface of the screw tape letters, uh, put this, and, and I think this is such an important thing uh, to think about and to consider as we begin to talk about things like spiritual warfare. He says there's two equal and opposite errors in which our race, talking about the human race, can fall about the devils, okay? One is to disbelieve in their existence. So to say, you know what? That stuff doesn't exist. That kind of stuff, I'm not even going to worry about it. What you see is what you get. So he says the first thing is to say it doesn't exist altogether. The other is to believe, but to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So you got two sides of the pendulum here. One side is to say they don't exist, they don't believe. But then the other side is for us to dabble around in that, to be a little too curious about that. Not just be aware, but to really begin to look into it. Look at what it says right here. They themselves, talking about demons and 
spiritual warfare, things like that, the principalities, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So a person who's materialistic, this is all there is, nothing but material, the world around you, or a magician, someone who is dabbling around it, they have the same delight. And so where does God want us? God wants us to be aware. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. I hope that today, as we walk through this passage, that it will just make you a little bit more aware, as our verse has been talking about, our theme verse, of, of not just focusing on what is seen, but also what is unseen. So for us to pay attention. You got there on the back of your notes and we'll also put it up here. Paul, just as a reminder, has on his third missionary journey. He's in Ephesus. He's walked through, he's encouraged some other churches throughout the area of Galatia and he's come through Asia and now he is in the area you can see right here in, in, in Ephesus. And he's, he's been spending about two years here. So he, he's not just passing through on this particular trip. He's really spending some time here and there's some things that happen that are pretty amazing. In fact, I want you to look with me in Acts chapter 19. We're going to start right here in verse 11. I'm just going to kind of walk us through uh, this passage through verse 20, and we'll kind of talk about some of the amazing things that are taking place. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hand, so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Wow, that's pretty powerful stuff. When you've got a handkerchief that has touched Paul's skin, and you're able to take that to someone else and place it on them, and faith and action is all coming together at once, and that person is healed, that's a pretty big deal. And you need to see right here that there's, that there's two distinctions. Don't miss this. It talks about diseases left them. Look at the end of verse 12. So the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So you've got two things of, of evil, essentially. You've got things of this fallen world, disease, but then you've got fallen spirits. You've got demons and all that kind of stuff that's taking place. So don't miss the distinction. Don't try to blend them together. We also live in a fallen world. Do we deal with disease? Do we have people in our lives that are in the hospital? Yes, we do. We deal with this. But let's not also miss the fact that we live in an area where things are taking place around us in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. Then it goes on from there in verse 13 and says, Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, these are, these are guys that just kind of travel around from place to place. Some scholars, they didn't really know if, if these guys were, you know, it says that they're, they're Jewish. They might have been Jewish in name. Um, they might have they, they been con men. We, we really don't know. But they also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now I want to stop right here. Because what's happening is you've got different powers colliding. I want, I want you to see this. When Jesus came and when he walked the earth, okay? So prior to this, prior to his, his death on the cross and his resurrection, when Jesus is walking around and he's doing his ministry, yes, he was ministering to people out of compassion. He loves people. He is gracious. He, he, he cares about them. But in addition to his compassion and his grace, we've also got to see this, is that God uses miracles to prove that he is who he says he is, okay? When Jesus came to earth, when Jesus came into Palestine, did he heal every single person with a disease? Well, if they were brought to him, yes. But he didn't heal just everyone widespread. He didn't just go around the whole earth and heal every single person. He healed the ones that were brought to him. He healed the ones that were there, the ones that came and spoke to him. So yes, he's compassionate, but he was also proving that he was the son of God and that he says who he was. So Jesus healed diseases. Jesus had authority over nature. 
You remember when he is, he's on the Sea of Galilee and the storm rises up and the disciples said, we're going to die. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the storm. So he's got authority over disease. He's got authority over nature. And then we also see that he has authority over demons. He was casting out demons. And so all of this was meant to reveal that Jesus is who he says he is. Now we're past that point. We're in the, the New Testament church. The church is beginning to spread. The gospel is beginning to go out. And so don't forget that these acts happen so that we can fully understand this isn't just a matter of faith. This is a matter, oh, do you believe? This is also a matter of power. I love that when the Apostle Paul, don't have the verse to give you to put up here on the screen, but he talks about how the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. And we've got to understand that because I think a lot of times our Christian faith is all talk. But is it a matter of power in our own lives? And so you've got these these other guys, and they're going to try to do, look at this, the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, and, and then look at how they say it at the end of verse 13. I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Anybody see the, the weird thing about that? It's not I command you in the name of Jesus. It's I command you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. So obviously they didn't know this Jesus. They're just trying to use this statement to cast out demons. In verse 14, it says, seven sons of Siva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this and the evil spirit. Now, this is so bizarre. The evil spirit answered them. Imagine this. I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? This is where I got my title for for our sermon day. Who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit, look at this, jumped on them overpowered them all and prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. And when this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, remember Paul's been there for two years, both Jews and Greeks, okay, they became afraid in hell. Don't miss this. I'm going to come back to this. The name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. Well, what happened after that? What was the result after that? Look at verse 18. Many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. So they had come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But here's what had happened. Even though they had come to know Christ as their Savior, they, were, they might have still been dabbling in some of these practices. Well, you see what happens here and they wake up. And then in verse 19, it says, while many of those who had practiced magic, they collected their books and burned them in front of everyone so that they calculated the value of all these books they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver and in this way the uh, the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed powerful stuff things that man that we don't even think about so there's a couple things that I want you to see here how do we apply this to our lives I don't know about you but I'm not I'm not that I know of dealing with demoniacs on a day in and day out basis But we are dealing with the devil and his schemes on a day in and day out basis. So how do we deal with this? So let's take a look in your notes. The enemy has a strategy. He's got a strategy. Do you realize this? He's got a strategy for you. He's got a strategy for your family. What is his strategy? Because if we can understand his strategy, then we can understand how to defeat him. Okay. So the enemy's strategy, I just want you to write a couple of these things down real quickly, is to affect your mind to affect your mind. He wants to blind you. He wants to blind you. He wants to blind us as as believers, and he especially wants to blind unbelievers. The devil does not want people to get saved. He is going to hell, and he's wanting to take as many people with him as possible. So what is his strategy? His strategy is to blind them. Let me put this verse up here on the screen, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. That's talking about people who don't know Christ. There's a veil over their eyes. In their case, don't miss this, the God, notice, not a big G, little G, okay? So it's talking about the devil, it's talking about the enemy. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. 
So his strategy, especially when it comes in the area of unbelievers, is to blind them. Have you ever tried to share your faith with someone and it was like talking to a brick wall? You've been there. I've been there. They're blinded. And so how can you pray for people? Have you ever said, I don't even know how to pray for this person. You can pray that their eyes would be open to the power of Christ and that he died for them and that he loves them and he wants them to be saved. Well, what about us as far as believers? That's for unbelievers. Well, for believers, you might jot this uh, passage of Scripture, this reference right here, Romans 12, verse 2. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says, don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't look like the things of this world. Remember, we just saw the God of this age, okay? So the world follows the God of this age. Don't be conformed to this world. But look at this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you, you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. So for us in this passage, we see that, 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 that we need to constantly be renewing our mind. That's why you're here today. Do you ever wonder why you come on Sunday morning? Everyone, why, why do I do this? It's because you are renewing your mind weekly, daily. We need to come together. We need to renew our minds so that we can go against the devil and his schemes. Okay, so his first strategy is to, is to get into your mind and to blind you. The second thing, his strategy is to affect your will, to affect your will. He wants to bait you. He wants to bait you. Now, some of y'all, y'all, y'all know, um, uh, I went, I went, suppose I, I hung out with a group of guys that were fishing yesterday. I did not fish. Okay. Some of y'all know this. I am not a fisherman. Okay. I do not like to fish. I like to catch, but I do not to, like, like to fish. But one of the things that had happened, we were out there and, and we had a great time. We were hanging out. We were talking. We brought our kids out there. We had a, we had a really good time. We didn't catch anything, you know, but we had a, we had a good time. Part of it is we probably didn't have the right bait. Um, but, but nevertheless, when we're out there, I want you to understand what happens with bait. When you think of a fish, what's happening with that bait? You're taking something that that fish wants naturally. Food. What's wrong with being hungry? What's wrong with seeking out food? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, what are you doing though? You're hiding the hook. And that's what happens in our lives. That's Satan's strategy. He will take things in your life, in my life, that God has made, but he will hide the hook. He'll take sexual things. God has made you a sexual being. But he will take that, that natural thing, in your life and in my life, and he will hide the hook. And sexual immorality will lead you down a road where you are no longer in a place where you can... You know, where you're not in a place of power anymore. Same thing that happens with greed. There's nothing wrong with wanting to provide for your family. I mean, those are natural things. Am I, am I right? And so, so here you, you take those things that are natural, but then he hides the hook and he uses that with, with greed. Anger. Anger in your life. There are things like holy and righteous anger, but he'll take that and he'll hide the hook and he'll let you explode and he'll make you, uh, not make you, but you will say things that you cannot take back. Do you see this? He gets into the will. He wants to bait you. And so we're tempted. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, For Jesus himself has suffered when he is tempted. He's able to help those who are being tempted. And we don't have time to go through this, but how did Jesus, how did Jesus respond when he was tempted? He responded by talking and using the word of God. So he uses the mind and the will. And then finally, this, when things get, when they go really awry, the enemy strategy is to affect your consciousness. He wants to bind you. He wants to put you into bondage. Now this is when things go really dark. Okay, you can almost see a progression. You give your mind over to him, give your will over to him, and then the consciousness, okay? This is when things go dark. And I want to explain some of these things to you because I'm sure that you have some questions. For a believer, listen to me. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you cannot be possessed by the devil. You cannot be possessed, okay? Doesn't mean that you can't be in bondage, okay? There are some things in your life that you can be in bondage to. But for him to take over your consciousness like we see here, 
That cannot happen. The Bible says that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, okay? So you can't have the Holy Spirit of Almighty God inside of you coinciding with, with the demonic. It doesn't work that way, okay? But for an unbeliever, they can be possessed. And this happens, a lot of times we say, well, Pastor Dan, why don't I see this very often? Because it does happen around us, I guarantee you that, but in areas of the world where there are idolatry and witchcraft, and especially, let's just talk about here, being here in New Orleans, there's things like voodoo, you will see possession because they have given themselves over, they've opened themselves up to that. And we could say in our day and age, we don't see so many, we don't see that, but the stories are there. And it's usually where the effect of overcoming the mind and the will culminate in this openness to the occult. And can I just talk to you? I know this is kind of weird here on a Sunday morning. This is why you got to stay away from things like Ouija boards. Got to stay away. Your kids, certain games. This is where you as a parent, certain games, certain movies. You need to be on them like white on rice to be able to say, okay, what are you watching? What are you looking at? What are you doing? Because there is an openness there that we do not want them. And so to the point that where he would take over, a demon can take over the, in the medical sense, let's just talk about this, the central nervous system of a human being. It happens, okay? So in light of all that and in light of what we've looked at today, what do we learn from this? What do we learn about spiritual warfare? Well, I'm so glad that you asked, okay? Because, here's what I want you to see. You've got your notes right there. I want you to pay attention. Therefore, we must learn, write this down, the importance of spiritual authority. The importance of spiritual authority. Now, I hope that you understand. I'm not telling you these things this morning to freak you out. Okay? I hope you know that. I'm telling you these things to prepare you. If you don't hear anything that I've said all morning, this right here is by far the most important. Spiritual warfare isn't about whatever they make out usually in the movies, okay? Winning in circumstances of spiritual warfare is entirely about authority. We talked about it earlier when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. He quotes the scriptures all three times, all three temptations. He quotes the scriptures. Yes, the word of God is powerful. We, call, we, we talk about it in Ephesians chapter 6. It is the sword of the spirit. But what makes the word of God so powerful when dealing with darkness is that it holds the authority. Do you hold the authority? Do your words hold the authority? No, they do not. The word of God has the authority authority okay so when it comes to demonic possession not only does the word of god have authority but also the name of god has authority we look right here in in verse 13 and says now some of the itinerant jews were exorcists now look at this were also attempting to pronounce the name of the lord jesus so here it says they were also attempting so obviously when the apostle paul when he would when, when he would take someone and, and he would uh, cast out the demon, okay, he would invoke the name of the Lord. We saw this way back in uh, Acts chapter 16. Remember the young girl that could tell the future? Some of y'all were here for that. Acts chapter 16, if you want to look it up, verses 17 and 18. When he cast that little girl's demon out, he cast it out by the name of Jesus, okay? That's how this works. Authority, the word of God and the name of God. And so they're able to cast it out. Now, let me give you a, a great example of how this works, okay? I think you can understand it, but just to really go a little bit deeper. So um, I took my, my eight-year-old this week to go get um, some frozen custard because frozen custard is the greatest ice cream of all time, okay? It is so good, so smooth. So we went this week and we got some, some frozen custard. We had the family with us. And so anyway, I, there was a misunderstanding, and, and so uh, I thought that the little one, my, my, my little daughter, uh, my three-year-old, was going to be able to uh, just kind of share with someone. But anyway, I only ordered three things, and so we all sit down at the table, and my eight-year-old looks at me and goes, where's mine? 
And I said, I'm so sorry. There's a misunderstanding. I thought that she was going to share it with someone. I said, I said, Here, here's what I want you to do. And I pulled out my wallet and I pulled out my credit card and I handed it to her. And I said, go up to the counter and I want you to order your own. OK, so I was trying to help her be big, you know, and do all that. So I helped her get get into that. So I handed her my credit card. Now, let me ask you this. Whose name is on that credit card? My name. Whose resources are tapped into that credit card? Mine, right? But I let her use my card, which encompasses my authority, and she was able to get what she needed and what she wanted. Have you ever thought about this? That's why when we pray, when we pray, even all morning, you might have not even noticed this. When we pray, we ask things. And then at the very end of our prayer, what, what do we usually say? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed that? We say that. What are we doing? We are invoking his authority. It's not our authority. It's not our card, if you will. It is his authority. And this is a great spiritual principle to know, even if you're not casting out demons. That you and I are nothing and that he is everything and that it's only by his authority that we are able to do anything in the spiritual realm. Our prayer life is under his name, his authority, our thought life under his name and his authority, the circumstances in our lives, when we're trying to discern the circumstances in our life, we need to be brought under his authority. This is why when that song comes on on the radio, there's power in the name of Jesus. I want your mind to go straight to the credit card and go, I don't have any resources of my own, but I know whose name is not on the card, but on my heart. Is this making sense to you? So we go with the importance of spiritual authority. And so here they are. They're trying to cast it out with according to this authority. That brings me to my second thing that I want you to write down. Therefore, we must learn, second thing, an instance in this nature of spiritual fraud. Of spiritual fraud. Okay? So we see again in verse 13, they attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those. And look how they use it. I command you by... The Jesus that Paul preaches. And this is the most bizarre thing to me. Is this bizarre to you? I know who Jesus is. And I know who Paul is. But who are you? Isn't that amazing? That when you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness, they know your name. That's powerful. Does the kingdom of darkness see you as a threat? Do they see me as a threat? I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who are you? And they're trying to invoke this name. And then we see this. Remember, so this demonic possession, I want us to see how dangerous things can get when you are not using the authority that God has given you. It says that in verse 15, the evil spirit answered him. I know Jesus. I recognize Paul. Who are you? Verse 16. And the man who had the evil spirit. Now look at this. Takes over the central nervous system. Let's just talk about it in medical terms. And, and jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Wow. Powerful stuff. But here's what I want us to see is that we have to do things in the authority of Jesus. Otherwise, it's fraud. Now, let's go back to that analogy of my daughter using my card to buy ice cream. OK, my daughter has a relationship with me. She's got a relationship with me. She is my child. And so she is using my card, my name, my resources with my permission. Now, let's talk. What if someone were to take my card which has my name on it, who does not have a relationship with me and try to use it for their own purposes. What if someone tried to do that? That is called fraud and it's against the law. You see the difference between my daughter walking up to the cash register and paying with my card and some random person walking up to the cash register paying with my card is that she has a relationship with me. 
Here's what I want you to understand. Here's the principle. There were, there's no invoking the name or the authority of God without having a relationship with God. That is a major no-no. And the demons call them out and say, who are you? And so here, they knew Paul. Of course they knew Jesus because of his authority and his ability to disrupt the kingdom of darkness. And so this begs the question again, do the demons know who I am? Am I a disruption to the kingdom of darkness? And then you see what happens. The effects of all this begin to trickle down as you get into verse uh, 18. And as you get into verse 18, it says that many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. They are confessing their sin. They're confessing that they've been dabbling around in darkness. While many of them who had practiced magic, collecting their books and burning them in front of everyone so that they calculated their value to be found to be 50,000 pieces of silver. This is no small amount of money. This is a, if scholars talk about this, 50,000 pieces of silver, is that a lot today? Yes. But if you really want to get down it, that is 150 years of work for one individual to do. 150 years of the normal labor. That's how much money we're talking about here. And so what happens is because of this situation, write this down for number three. Therefore, we have to learn the, the insistence of spiritual purification. The insistence of spiritual purification. And so what we see is that people realized you cannot be a spiritual fraud when it comes to faith in Christ. They recognized that he was no one to trifle with, but someone who to bow in faith to. And as we get ready to close, this is why this is so important. It's because God is loving. He is gracious. He is compassionate. But don't miss this. God is powerful. Jesus is powerful. He has the authority. And quite frankly, you do not mess with our God or take him lightly. I was reading a story this week of a man who owned a restaurant. And in the article, it talks about how he had this beautiful daughter. I, man, I, I can sense where he was going. He has, I, I've got two daughters. Man, they're beautiful. He had a beautiful daughter. She was 14 years old. She was already six foot tall. Can you imagine? Now, that's a, that's a volleyball player, a basketball player. That's the one you want on that team. She was already six foot tall, beautiful flowing hair. One night, a drunk customer saw her in the restaurant and began to catcall her, and began to cause a scene. Well, let me tell you a little something about this little girl that I read about. The reason that this girl was six foot tall at age 14 is because her daddy was seven foot tall and a rugby player. And so as this drunk customer began to catcall his daughter, he walked around the corner to handle the situation. And this drunk customer saw him come around the corner and he sobered up real fast. In fact, as I read the article, he made a dash for the door. He tripped and fell and he broke his tooth up against the railing that was next to the steps. He was sobered up quick and he realized that he didn't need to be there. Now, why do I tell you that story? It's because the people of Ephesus who had indulged themselves in black magic and idolatry, they finally saw the real God in all of his authority and power, and they sobered up real quick. And the same should be true of us. God loves you. He is all loving, but he is not a wimp. Our God is not a wimp. And if his name can overpower even the most violent and powerful demons, then you and I, we need to take him seriously. And if we haven't given him our lives, let's just talk. If we haven't given him our lives, then we are truly taking our lives and our souls into our own hands. And so I just ask this question as we get ready to conclude our time together today. Who are you? 
Do you know him? Who are you compared to an almighty, all powerful God? That's, that'll sober you up real fast. Let's bow and have a word of prayer.